The queen has spoken and it's kind of f***ed up. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Built Bar and we are back with a heavily requested Harper's Bazaar What I Eat In A Day review on the domestic queen herself, Martha Stewart. So first let me talk about my sponsor, Built Bar. You guys now know that I've been sampling these bars for a few months now and I'm still totally loving them. And thanks to your comments, I also learned about the joys of eating these slightly melted in the microwave. So good. I mean, throw a little ice cream on top. Oh my gosh, yes. But I don't honestly eat a whole lot of protein or energy bars usually because I just don't love the texture or flavor. But I do think that protein bars can be a really convenient source of protein for busy days. And if they taste like a marshmallow nugget chocolate bar, you can sign me up. So today's flavor, salted caramel. Mm -hmm. I'm a salted caramel freak. Mm. Come on. Well, that is good. Mm. Also a quick reminder about the zero guilt label on the package. I mean, you know what I'm gonna say, right? Unless you stole it from a baby or a breastfeeding mama, all food is zero guilt. But anyways, nutrition wise, each bar has 17 grams of protein. So they're ideal if you want to like add it to a snack or a meal to really bump up the satiety factor. And since they are lower in sugar, if I were to have this as a post-workout snack, I would always try to pair it with maybe some fruit or a piece of toast or oatmeal to balance the protein with carbs and some natural sugars. So if you wanna give these bars a try, use my promo code and check out the link below for 20% off of your order. Also, you can pause the screen or look at the description below to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out. All right, Martha, give it to me. It's very difficult for me to stay in bed later than say 6.15. I wake up really early, way earlier than that. I've already read the newspaper, the New York Times, cover to cover, done the crossword puzzle, tried to do wordplay. Oh girl, I feel seen. I like to think I relate to Martha because clearly both of us have forgotten what it's like to chill the f out. Then I go into the kitchen for my green juice. Uh, scratch that on the relatability factor. This is where we diverge. My green juice is very special to me. I think it's really the secret of good skin. I think it's the secret of good, healthy hair. So the green juice, cucumbers parsley, mint if I have it, a little piece of ginger, which I do not grow, like a half of an orange, including the skin. Okay, so first of all, the woman is 79. So her hair is truly hair goals for me right now at 33. The woman looks great. Second, it's somewhat true that eating an abundance of fruits and vegetables, which are rich in vitamin C, which can help support collagen production, may help support healthy skin and hair. But will getting more antioxidants in your diet instantly make your hair more beautiful? Probably not as much as good genes would, especially if you're not actually deficient. But sure, like a general healthy diet can help support strong, healthy, hair and skin, true. The vegetables primarily come from my vegetable greenhouse or my garden. All year round I'm growing my own vegetables because I want organic, I want clean, I want tasty, and I want healthy. What I don't love is Martha's suggestion that she grows her own vegetables to make sure that they're, you know, clean and healthy. That to me feels a little exclusive and also kind of misinformed. All vegetables are good vegetables to me. They don't need to be talked to sweetly or grown in organic fertilizer from Martha Stewart's personal compost. In fact, they don't need to be organic at all. I've talked about organics before in my video on Sorel Amour right here, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I will just say that there is no strong evidence that organic produce is significantly more nutritious than conventional. So for me, if your budget comes down to choosing more conventional produce or less organic produce, I will always recommend more of whatever is more economical to you. I generally 
run outside and get in my Polaris. And I drive around the property. I also check on my animals. I check on the horses. I check on the donkeys. I have five of uh, Sicilian donkeys. They're really cute and they're very lively. I check on the 20 peacocks. I check on the 34 homing pigeons. And I check on the geese that come from four different countries. Oh my God. Only Martha would have 20 peacocks and 17 international geese because American geese are just not bougie enough for this queen. Okay, so I am kind of jealous about the donkeys though because those do sound like they would be pretty cool. In the morning, I'm making waffles. I go back to my kitchen and I treat myself to the most delicious cappuccino made on my trusted San Marco two cup cappuccino machine. <laughs> I feel like Martha is trolling us with all these like luxury brand name dropping. I just think it's hilarious that she clearly has no interest in even seeming somewhat relatable. It's sort of the hub of the kitchen and I just found really good organic milk. I mean, in her head, she's probably like cackling and being like, bow down bitches, I'm Martha Stewart. You peasants cannot even like dream about a day in my over the top foodie palace. And it's true, we can't. But anyways, I feel like Martha Stewart and I started off this day on the same page with the type A can't sleep, won't sleep neuroticism situation. But I've realized that the big difference is that Martha is making all of us feel like lazy f while she gets up to frolic in her foodie themed adult Disneyland. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, I'm up early because I've got a screaming child on my boob and another one having a tantrum because I told him that I wouldn't microwave his smoothie that morning. Yeah, so same, same, but different. I am not a snacker. I try very hard to keep nothing in the house that will entice me as a snack. That said, uh, people are always bringing me delicious pastries from New York and breads from here and there, but I really like to keep that away from me. So this is feeling a little like the Kelly Ripa interview. I mean, these are definitely type A women and I too identify with that, so I get it. My sense from this interview thus far is that Martha has no shortage of access to quality food in her home. But when she says she's not a snacker and doesn't keep snacks in the house or anything that would entice her, I think she means that she doesn't buy or eat lower quality processed food snacks. So unlike my man, Little Yachty, we're talking probably no chips, no candy bars, no cheap crackers or other packaged foods. And that's cool and totally fine. But since we haven't really seen much of a meal yet, just like a fancy cappuccino and a low calorie green juice, I definitely think there's room for a snack or for a more substantial breakfast here. Something ideally with some protein and fat to carry her to lunch. So that could be some whole foods too, like yogurt and fruit, cheese and whole grain crackers, trail mix, or some nut butter on toast. But let's take a look at what her lunch looks like. I try very, very hard to eat a very light lunch, maybe a tuna fish salad. I, I, I make a really good tuna fish salad. Italian tuna, of course, packed in olive oil, celery, crispy apple, maybe a half of a shallot, lots and lots of lemon juice, and a little bit of mayonnaise. Of course, Martha will find a way to turn the most humblest of lunch options, tuna salad, into a posh highbrow dish. First of all, you don't need fancy Italian tuna in olive oil to make a healthy tuna salad. I looked up the bottle that they photographed in this video, which may or may not be what Martha actually eats, but it cost almost 10 times what I pay for tuna at Walmart. I'm sure it's delicious and obviously she can afford the best. So Martha girl, you go and buy the best. But generally speaking, Tuna is one of the most economic protein options that you can buy. So I'm just saying that you don't need to live on a 20 acre mansion to have tuna salad for lunch. I will just flag that if you're eating a lot of canned tuna, you may wanna opt for the light variety, which is lower in mercury than the more popular albacore variety. So albacore is still lower in mercury than fresh tuna steaks, but most authorities recommend limiting your consumption to one to two cans of albacore per week. 
Also, it's worth noting that some light tuna labeled as tono or gourmet may actually be made with larger skipjack varieties, which may have comparable amounts of mercury to albacore. In other words, your bargain bin tuna may actually be healthier than Martha's gourmet version if limiting heavy metal consumption is a priority for you. Just saying. But mercury aside, I'm sure if Martha is making a tuna salad, that it's a damn good tuna salad. And I love that we've got our protein, we've got some healthy fats in the olive oil, plus a little produce in the mix. But again, with so little fuel in her morning, I was definitely expecting a more substantial lunch. At least a few slices of bread in there to make a sandwich would help to bulk this up. But anyways, let's see what dinner looks like. Last Saturday, I made a delicious dinner. I had gone to the store and I bought a plump, organic d'artagnan chicken and i bought uh, a rack of lamb for string beans i went to my greenhouse and i picked all kinds of beautiful frise and uh, soft butter crunch lettuces i've recently learned how to roast the chicken sort of like nomad style or 11 madison park style <laughs> in case you're not in the loop on the most exclusive roast chicken dinners Martha is referencing New York City's celebrated three Michelin star restaurant, 11 Madison Park, which was awarded the world's best restaurant in 2017. Getting a reservation is literally an Olympic sport. And the meal with wine pairings will cost you a modest $1,100 per person. So yeah, my guess is that most people watching this little interview won't know much about this magical roast chicken technique. But I'm a foodie, so now I'm intrigued. Martha, tell me more. Then the day of cooking, um, you if you have some black truffles lying around. I'm sorry, if you just have some black truffles lying around? This is like that popular Instagram meme, top 0.000001% style. Tell me you're a multimillionaire without saying you're a multimillionaire. Take a whole stick of unsalted butter, the best butter like Plugra or Kerrygold, and you slather it all over the skin of the chicken. Okay, so I hear a lot of influencers talk about only using Kerrygold or a similar luxury butter brand. But does it actually make a difference to your health? So I will say in terms of flavor, that's obviously subjective. But personally, yeah, I can taste the difference, especially if I'm using it on something really neutral like bread, where the flavor of the butter can really shine. So I do personally get the appeal when it comes to taste. Kerrygold also gets its golden yellow hue because the cows are grass fed instead of corn fed, which does give it slightly higher levels of beta carotene, conjugated linoleic acid, and omega-3 fats. Having said that, I wouldn't personally bank on butter to get my omega-3 fats because you'd have to eat a lot of butter to get any kind of measurable benefit. And butter is kind of one of those things that we usually recommend consuming in moderation. So if you like the flavor of grass-fed butter and you're consuming it as like a luxury item, not so much as a heavily used cooking oil, then by all means, like it might be worth the splurge to you but I would personally choose it mainly for the flavor and using it where the flavor actually matters and not so much for any of its added health benefits. But anyway, back to the meal. A good roast chicken or lamb dinner with spring veggies always sounds divine and obviously inherently very nutrient dense. But I'm getting the sense that Martha tends to eat pretty low carb. I mean, we've got no carbs at breakfast, no carbs at lunch, not a lot of carbs at dinner, which again, totally cool if it works for her, but I'm just flagging to point out that I think there's definitely room here for like a sweet potato or a slice of bread. I really like to open an appropriate bottle or two or three of wine. I really like to drink uh, just a small vodka cocktail. I never drink alone, but when friends come over, um, having a nice vodka on the rocks with a slice of orange from my own greenhouse. And the vodka has to be really good. It has to be like the best Belvedere vodka. Nothing but top shelf for our girl Martha. 
In my refrigerator, good Parmesan cheeses, cream cheese, really good organic milk, butter, and I have fresh eggs from the chickens. For all the money that Martha saves avoiding snack foods in her house, I am sure she more than makes up for it with her organic dairy budget. There's definitely a growing interest in organic dairy, making up about 15% of all organic food sales and almost 5% of all dairy sales. So why are people shelling out more cash for organic milk? Well, in short, most of the interest in organic dairy that I've seen from consumers is related to pesticides, antibiotics, and growth hormones. So let's do a wee overview to set the record straight. It is true that all organic dairy must be produced without any GMOs, synthetic pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides, and that recombinant bovine growth hormone is not allowed in organic dairy production. But a lot of conventional milk today also isn't using growth hormones in their lot anymore, since this has become such a heavily requested consumer selling point. So growth hormones in dairy have been declining in the general dairy supply for many years now. Great. As for antibiotics, both organic and conventional cows can be treated with antibiotics, but they'll be milked and the milk will be discarded. The only difference is that an organic cow will be permanently removed from the milking herd and the conventional one will be put back into rotation once the antibiotics have completely cleared her system. So again, no antibiotics in milk. The other myth is that all organic cows are 100% grass fed, which as we already mentioned, would suggest that the milk is higher in omega-3s. And it can be, about 50% more than conventional, which I think it's pretty significant. But it's worth noting that organic grain, corn, and soybeans are also allowed as part of organic jurisdiction. So if you want 100% grass-fed milk, that's something specific that you're gonna have to source. I baked two big Sally Lunn babka bread. A slice of that is light and fluffy. It's delicious, lightly toasted, and it makes the best, the best breakfast bread pudding. Oh my gosh, babka bread pudding, yes. I mean, if this is how Martha wants to eat her carbs, I can't fault her on that. Now, I expect she doesn't eat babka bread pudding every day on the regular, but I would say based on the rest of her day, she totally could if it brought her joy. And on that note, what can we say about Martha Stewart's diet? Well, it's certainly healthy. There's no doubt that Operating a legitimate farm has its perks when it comes to a nutritious diet. She's got a bounty of beautiful, fresh, local fruit, veggies, and eggs, which don't have to undergo long travel periods, and that generally will mean that they're able to be consumed at peak nutrient levels. She also has money to buy really high-quality artisan cheeses, and butter, and milk, and to casually snack on black truffles instead of drugstore chocolate truffles. And she drinks top shelf liquor with a twist of orange from her orangery, not sugary coolers from the corner store bodega. I mean, I'm confident that the quality of ingredients going into this woman's body is probably pretty top notch, but it just doesn't seem like a lot. I know she's almost 80, so her nutrition needs are certainly not as robust as a lot of the influencers that you see me review here. But still, your average woman over 50 living a somewhat active lifestyle needs at least 1,800 calories a day. And Martha seems pretty involved in wrangling her donkeys and geese every day. So my guess is that she could definitely use more carbs. So let's switch gears and offer a few gentle nutrition tips based on this interview. First of all, we could definitely try to beef up our breakfast with a source of carbs, protein, and fat. And also, of course, to add more carbs throughout the day. This could mean maybe some oatmeal and boiled eggs with her green juice at breakfast, a few slices of bread on her tuna salad at lunch, and maybe a couple roast potatoes or sweet potatoes at dinner. Simple and still very in line with her local luxury brand. Moving on to Martha's relationship with food, obviously given the format of this video, I've had to make a lot of super unscientific, unsubstantiated assumptions here, but I do think it's safe to say that the woman is a bit of a control freak. I mean, she's Martha F Stewart. Of course she's type A. The woman is famous for teaching people how to 
effortlessly match a robin's egg blue table runner with your stationary organizer bins to create a seamless vista when you look across the room while you're serving homemade croissants at brunch. She's not exactly living the messy, disheveled, I showered once this week reality of so many working families right now. So as a result, it isn't really surprising to me that her day feels pretty regimented and a little disconnected from reality. There's definitely a set of unspoken rules that she probably lives by in general, and it wouldn't be surprising to me if that leaks into her food choices as well. And that's totally cool. But I did hear some moralizing talk around food in her interview as she talked about organic homegrown food as being clean or more healthy, and that she didn't keep snacks or other foods that would entice her around in the house. That alone tells me that Martha likely has some strong opinions on what is acceptable and unacceptable when it comes to what to eat. A lot of the time, these beliefs are rooted in status, class, and privilege, in addition to being influenced by popular wellness culture. So while I think that Martha's diet is generally quite beautiful and healthy, and the woman's physical and mental stamina seems like a pretty good testament of that, it's also important to note that being in an economic position to casually throw truffles onto your roast chicken or leisurely enjoy your 20 acre farm may also play a significant role. What I'm saying is kind of obvious, but let's not compare ourselves to Martha Stewart or her diet. Even if you manage to emulate her diet to a T, her own socioeconomic status and life opportunities may likely result in a completely different outcome for health. And on that note, I just want to say that I love Martha with all of my heart. I mean, her unapologetic You Can't Touch Me luxury brand is deeply entertaining to me. Not relatable in any way, but entertaining, no doubt. Honestly, I could listen to the woman talk about her homing pigeons all day. But thankfully, I have the critical thinking skills and the sense of self to know that I don't need that life to be happy either. So hopefully this video inspired a similar critical thinking process for you. A big thank you again to Built Bar for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below with who you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.